Thank you for joining us at Creative Church. We pray that this word blesses your heart and blesses your life. And if it has, I want to encourage you to feed what's feeding you and to give to what is giving to you. The easiest way to do this is to visit creative.church give. Thank you for your faithfulness and your generosity. Again, we pray that this message blesses your heart and blesses your life. All right. Come on, we can do better than that. This is for Jesus today. Amen. All right. We're going to continue worshiping. You can sit down. We're going to worship God in um, giving you an opportunity to give to the Lord. And how many of you, how many of you, God has been good to you? Anybody? God's been good to you. Amen. And uh, I want to welcome our friendly campus and everyone watching online. And we're going to give you an opportunity to give to the Lord. I'm going to ask our ushers to come out into the aisles. And you can give a very traditional way. Uh, if you want to worship that way, you can just uh, give through our envelopes. You can raise a hand. One of our ushers will bring you an ink pen and an envelope. Just raise your hand. Or you can give through, um, uh, well, here you can mail something in. You can mail an envelope in. Uh, but you can also text uh, to give or go to our, our website or our app to give. Uh, but however you give, I want to say thank you for giving to the Lord. Thank you for your generosity and loving God's house. And it's because of your generosity. You know, the government doesn't fund this work. I don't know if you know that, but it's not funded by the government. It is funded by the generosity of the people in this room. Somebody say amen. And so uh, it is because of your generosity that we're able to invest in the kids, that we're able to do all the things that we're doing, to see teenagers get baptized. All of that is a result of your generosity. And so I wanna say thank you. I wanna take a moment out of the service and say thank you for giving to the Lord. However you do it, I want to uh, I want to always acknowledge people's generosity, those watching online and around the nation. So we're going to jump into the Word today. Uh, you guys ready for the Word? Anybody ready? I'm not feeling it at all. Is anybody ready for the Word today? All right. So I have no notes. I'm up here with just the Bible, and that's, that's enough. Is that all right? And so we're going to jump into the Word. The Lord spoke to me and told me to teach you how to spend some time with Him. And so that's what He really spoke to me, and uh, today's going to be very different from how we normally do uh, um, our services, but that's okay. Uh, that's why we say if you're visiting, take the three-visit challenge, because we believe relationships with Jesus are different every day. He'd minister on a boat, then he'd minister on the sea, then he'd speak to lepers and command them to be healed, touch a girl, and say, to like takuma, which means damsel arise. He, he would spit in the mud and heal somebody's eyes. He did things different so that you couldn't get God down pat. And I think many times in church, you know, we have to do this, then we have to do this, then we do this, and if we, we don't do it exactly, somebody goes into cardiac arrest and they can't breathe, but you're going to make it today. Just keep everybody breathe in, breathe out. You're going to make it. Everything's going to be fine. But I want to teach you today about how to spend time with Jesus. How to spend time with Jesus. What qualifies you for ministry is spending time with Jesus. What qualifies you to be a good dad? Spending time with Jesus. What, qual what, qualify what qualifies you to be a great wife? Spending time with Jesus. What qualifies you to have all the answers? Spending time with Jesus. Because he'll give you a heart of compassion. And compassion knows all the answers. Amen? And so if you have your Bibles, I want you to open them up or turn them on. Uh, today is not the day not to have your Bible. So if you have a phone, which is typically everybody, 14 and up, uh, download the YouVersion Bible app. We're going to go to the Passion Translation. And we're going to go through the book of 1 Timothy today. And um, I'm going to teach you about devotions. How many people have already eaten something today? Raise your hand if you've eaten something today. Huh? How many people are going to eat something today? All right. So everybody's planning on doing flesh devotions. You're going to make sure you get that body fed. So right now we're going to do some spiritual devotions. Most of us do flesh devotions three, four, five, seven, twelve, fifteen, thirty times a day, right? I'm kidding. At least three times a day. But, uh, you know, we're not always doing spiritual devotions, which is who you really are. You're not your body. How many people looked in a mirror today? All right. 
that, yeah, it adds up. I can see the people who did and the people who didn't, you know, right? <laughs> so most people look in a mirror. Uh, but if you, when you look in the mirror, you see your body, but your body's not who you are. You're a spirit. Amen? And you have a, a soul. You live in a body. But when God looks at you, he's looking at who you really are. He's looking at your spirit. Your spirit's going to live for eternity. Come on, can I get an amen on that, right? That's who you really are. And if you had to describe your spirit today to a sketch artist, what would you describe? Would it be somebody healthy? Would it be somebody full of joy, full of peace, full of life? Would, it, would they look nourished? Would they look healthy, strong, equipped? Or would they look malnourished? You know, would they look weak? Because that, that's who you really are. When you ask God to bring things into your life, God's not looking at your body. God's looking at who you are in your spirit. Or is your spirit man strong enough to handle that level of blessing? Because a blessing to somebody, giving somebody, uh, what, or what's a blessing to one person could be a curse to someone else because they're not ready for it. It's like if God gave you a jumbo jet, what can you do? Can you fuel it? Can you park it? Can you fly it? Can you afford it? It's, it'd be like, I can't get this. It's ruining my life. It's like somebody gave you an elephant. What you gonna do with it? So what's a blessing to one person? It could be a curse to you because you're not healthy enough to handle that level of blessing. Does that make sense to you? And so when you go to God and say, God, bless me with this, God's going, are you, are you healthy enough to handle that level of blessing? And that is based on your spirit, your ability to manage, your ability to work what God has given you, okay? And so we're going to go into this today. The book of 1 Timothy is a book written by the Apostle Paul. Everybody say the Apostle Paul. You know, the Apostle Paul, to describe this to you, uh, the Apostle Paul was like the Osama bin Laden of his day. He was a terrorist, okay? And he was terrorizing and uh, um, Christians. He literally went around um, and terrorized and arrested and murdered Christians. Us. That was his role, it was his job. He was paid to do it. He was really good at it. And he got radically saved. Anybody else been radically saved? He got radically saved on the road to Damascus. And Jesus appeared to him and he gave his life and got saved. And now he ends up writing two out of every three pages you flip through in the New Testament. It was written by someone who was a racist and a terrorist who got saved. So just so you think, if, if you think God hates everybody you hate, God has a way of saving the least likely. God has a way of redeeming the least likely. And God has a way of rescuing people that you thought he would never rescue and use for his glory. Somebody say amen about that, all right? So, you know, I always tell people that because just so you know, God's, God is cool with some people that you fell out with. You're like, what? Yep. God's like, oh, we talk all the time. What? Yep every day if you think god hates everybody you hate that's not the god that made you that's the god you made <laughs> oh jesus help us if god is it, god is really cool and has a great relationship with people that you have fallen out with just because you fall out with them doesn't mean god fell out with them praise the lord and so um he's writing this to the apostle uh, the Apostle Paul is writing this to Timothy, which is his apprentice, his intern. And he's beginning to talk to him about ministry. These are the things you need to know if you're going to be used by God. Because how many of you want to be used by God? Now, when we talk about devotions, uh, most, people, uh, most people don't do devotions or spend, spend time with the Lord um, until crisis comes. Okay? Most people come to Christ through crisis, not convenience. Okay? And I always tell you, you know what makes people pray? Me preaching on prayer don't make people pray. You know what makes people pray? Trouble. Trouble will make you pray. You won't have to read a book on prayer or anything. You will just start praying instantly. You'll be finding people. Would you pray for me? Would you pray for me? Would you pray for me? Prayer, you know what I'm saying? Trouble will make you pray. But the secret to keeping your blessing is understanding the same thing it took to get it is the same thing it's going to take to keep it. Okay? Now, it's kind of like exercise equipment. When I went in to buy a piece of exercise equipment and I asked the guy, you know, 
which one of these will help me lose weight? And he's like, the one you'll use. Great answer, man. I can see why everybody likes you. So clearly it's the one I'll use. And some people say, what do you have to pray in the morning? You don't have to pray in the morning. When you pray, I guess, is the best time to pray, right? But idols, if you have an idol in your life, it always wants your first and last. So if you struggle with an addiction in your life, that addiction wants you to worship it first in the morning and last at night. And that's one of the ways you'll know if you have an addiction or an idol in your life is what you're most tempted to do first in the morning and last at night. And so I always say, give that time to God and also give the evening to God. Give the evening to God. God owns the night. There's a sermon on our, on our um, YouTube page or whatnot that I preached that you can go and watch it. But God owns the night. So turn off the hate media. Can't get one amen on it. Turn off the hate media, turn off all that hate social media. And the last 30 minutes, the last hour of your night, start putting on some worship music, start putting in. How many people have ever worried? Raise your hand if you've ever worried. All right, raise your hand if you've ever worried for at least one whole day. Raise your hand if you've ever worried for at least a whole week. Great, so you all know how to meditate. Because that's what worry is. It's just using your faith in the wrong direction. Okay, so instead of it going negative, we're gonna put it on God. We're gonna put our, our, our heart and our thoughts on things positive. Can I get an amen? amen? All right, and we're gonna start thinking about what the possibilities are that God could do in our life, the opportunities that God wants to bring in our life, the goodness of the Lord in our life. We're gonna set our affections on Him, and we're gonna start, we're gonna, we're gonna turn off those, some of those movies, Netflix, all that kind of stuff, and the last 30 minutes, the last hour, we're gonna start putting it on Jesus, and watch how God begins to speak to you while you sleep. Many men in the Bible were called into the ministry while they slept. I was called to the ministry in a dream. All right? God wants to speak to you while you sleep. It will take away nightmares from your children. Praise the Lord. Nightmares that you're struggling with. And don't be ashamed. I did this at our New Believers class just on Tuesday. Let me free everybody in here of shame. Because anyone here goes, well, when I read my Bible, I can't always remember it. Even if you don't remember it all, it impacts you. I can't remember what I ate last week, but it made an impact. Come on. Your waistline is not dependent upon you remembering what you ate. Is that fair? All right. So let's just free ourselves of that self-loathing that we put on. And let's, let me free you of this. Well, when I pray, I fall asleep. I have eight children. All of them have fallen asleep talking to me, and I love it. So why would you think that God would be mad at you because you fell asleep talking to him you're his son you're his daughter he loves you it's just it's what it is it's the self-loathing guilt that satan wants to put on you which is not from god free yourself of that in jesus name and i think one of the best ways you could fall asleep is fall asleep talking to jesus better days require better nights amen and watch what god will do god owns the night the night does not belong to Satan. It belongs to the Lord. So tonight at midnight, what is today's date? The 13th? At, at 1201, your cell phone will go the 14th. It'll say tomorrow. It'll say it's morning. It'll say it's 1201 in the, the morning. Now, if you go open the window, it's dark. But your phone says it's morning because tomorrow starts at night. It doesn't start in the day. It starts at night. In the Bible, when you read the Bible, the day starts evening to morning. In Genesis, it says, and the evening and the morning was the first day. And the evening and the morning were the second day. In Genesis, and the evening and the morning were the third day. So even though you may not see the breakthrough, you may not see the light yet in your life, you have to believe that God is doing something new in your life. Even while it still looks dark, I'm preaching already. Even while it still doesn't look good, even while you can't see your way clear, you have to know that it's morning. And God, when he does something new in your life, you may not see the sun for another six hours, but you got to know it's morning. And you start worshiping at night. Praise the Lord. Man, I feel like I'm done. Like, I'm hungry already, y'all. We can just leave. 
All right? So when you, when you uh, do devotional, when you do time with the Lord, um, most people do it the way they, uh, they do church services. So they put some worship music on, then they read um, some text, chapter, or read it, and then they pray. You know, Lord, help me be a better man. Bless my family, my children. You know, help me do this, and I just thank you for being a loving God. And what does that raise your hand if that reflects something maybe in your world? Okay. So what I want to do is give you a, a different way, a different strategy in your time with the Lord. I'm going to let you know a little bit of how I do it, okay, and walk that through. Is that interesting to you? So why don't we, let's, let's write a sermon today. How about we do that? So I typically write those on my own, and then I come and tell you. But how about today we write a sermon together? Is that all right? Is that a little different? Is that okay? And let, let's, let's do something a little different. And so most people, when they, when they, do their devotions, they just read everything through and then they pray for some things, but the problem is they can't remember what they read, so it doesn't get in them, all right? So it's kind of like, um, let's do it this way. Hey, come, come, come on up here real quick. Hey, I'm, I'm Jonathan, how are you? What, what's your name? Larnell. Larnell, I forgot. How many people have ever met somebody and as soon as they told you their name, you forgot? Has that ever happened to you? All right, you can sit down. Thank you, Larnell. What, ci what city are, 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 do you live in? St. Paul. Okay. The reason why you forget Larnell's name as soon as he said it is because you don't know Larnell. Lar Larnell, and, and let me explain what I mean by Larnell doesn't mean anything to you. So you forget. It's not that like, oh, I don't, this guy means nothing to me. That's not the attitude. It's just like, I don't know him. Does that make sense? But once you know Larnell, it's like, oh, it's Larnell. You know, Larnell's in our internship. Larnell lives in St. Paul. Larnell does this, Larnell does that. You know, he, oh, he got baptized three weeks ago. Yeah, I know his family. Now you never forget Larnell because you know him. He means something to you. You have a memory with him. You have, you have some kind of like, you spent time together. Does that make sense to you? So the people that you do life with like that, you never forget their name because you know them. That's how you have to do devotion. Okay, so instead of reading the text all the way through, am I boring you? Instead of reading the text all the way through and then praying, what we want to do is read the text and see what stands out to us. And when it stands out to us, then we're going to pray on that text. We're going to pray that text. You ready? All right, here we go. First Timothy chapter one. Let's start at verse six. We're going to move kind of quick. Some believers have been led astray by teachings and speculations. They emphasize nothing more than empty words of men. They presume to be expert teachers of the law, but they don't have the slightest idea what they're talking about, and they simply love to argue. Don't look at anybody if this describes somebody, right? So you're, you're reading that, and you're like, that's really good information. That's great. I'm not feeling like that's for me right now. You know, so I'm going to go on. I'm reading, I'm reading. Now let's go down to verse 13. Verse 13. It says, mercy kissed me, even though I used to be a blasphemer and a persecutor of believers and scorned. Oh, that's for me. Mercy kissed me. How many people have ever, have ever experienced the mercy of God? Five people. Anybody ever experienced the mercy of God? You knew what you deserved, but because of God's mercy, he blessed you and he kept you. Does that mean anything in here to anybody? All right, so let's pray that now. Everybody lift a hand and say, thank you, Jesus, for your mercy. Thank you that I used to say a lot of negative things. I used to be scorned in my life, but you have turned that around. I'm flooded by your incredible grace. In Jesus' name, amen. So it says, mercy kissed me, even though I used to be a blasphemer, even though I used to be a persecutor of believers, scorned, what turned out to be true, I was ignorant and I didn't know what I was doing, but I was flooded with such incredible grace. I was flooded with grace. Now all of a sudden that verse on grace means something to me. So the next time I talk to somebody who's dealing with self-loathing, 
dealing with like they feel bad about themselves. They feel like they're going through challenges and they just feel like they've, they've made a lot of mistakes. You go to them and you just declare first Timothy chapter one, verse 14 says God is going to flood you with incredible grace upon your life in Jesus name. And the reason you can pray the word out when you leave here is because you pray the word when you do devotion. So if you want to learn to pray the word, how many of you would love to pray scripture over people? How many of you would just love to have scripture down in you that when you saw a person in you, you could just speak scripture over them? How many people would love that? The way to do that is by praying it in your devotion. Not just praying, not reading it, and then praying for a bunch of other things, but pray the word. Praise the Lord. All right. Verse 15, I can testify that the word is true and deserves to be received by all. For Jesus Christ came into the world to bring sinners back to life. Raise your hand. Thank you, Jesus, that you have brought me back to life. You brought my marriage back to life. You brought my children back to life. Some of you are like, I haven't prayed this much all year. I haven't read this much Bible all year. Is it okay that we read Bible and pray in church? If it freaks you out, I don't know what church to go, you should go to. I don't, I don't know where to send you. All right. Uh, verse 16, yet I was captured by grace. Everybody say, thank you, Lord, that I've been captured by grace. Man, isn't it great to be arrested by grace? Just arrest my family by grace. Capture me by grace. Hold me. Handcuff me by grace, all right, so that Jesus Christ could, could display through me the outpouring of his spirit as a pattern to be seen for all those who would believe in him for eternal life, that your life ought to be and my life ought to be a pattern, an example of someone who is in sin and someone who got saved because of Jesus Christ and they see the change in my life and now that they want to bring a change in their life, my life is an example, that's why you preach Jesus every day, all day, and at last resort, use words. All right? Let's get on to verse 18. So, Timothy, my son, I am entrusting you with the responsibility in keeping with the very first prophecies that were spoken over your life. The very first prophecy. I wish you had it written down. I wish you had it recorded, the prophecies your parents spoke over you. Sunday school teachers, anybody remember Sunday school? Sunday school teachers and words that were spoken over you in your life because demonic prophecies tend to stick with people. If you've ever been bullied, those were demonic prophecies. That's why you've got to open your mouth and put a word against a word. When the enemy opens his mouth, you've got to open yours. You've got to declare these things over your children because Satan loves to have demonic prophecies spoken over your children when you send them to school. You're stupid, you're ugly, you're a loser, you're a failure, nobody likes you. They, if anybody ever called you a name, it can stick with you because demonic prophecies are typically one word. That's why if you're here and you're a, a person in school, you need to vow, I will never be Satan's evangelist. I will not be a minister of Satan. I will speak life. I will speak grace. I will speak forgiveness. Come on, somebody. So what were the first prophecies spoken over your life and now in the process of fulfillment in this great work of ministry in keeping with the prophecy spoken over you with this encouragement, use your prophecies as weapons as you wage spiritual warfare by faith with a clean conscience. So you cannot wage spiritual warfare if you don't have a clean conscience. So if you go, I'm doing things I shouldn't be doing, I'm sleeping around, I'm doing drugs, I'm looking at things I shouldn't be looking at, I've got unforgiveness in my heart, whatever it is, whatever it is that makes you not feel clean. Makes you not feel clean. See, the different, uh, best way I can think to describe it is a lamb and a pig fall in the mud. Once they get in the mud, you can't tell the difference because sin is sin, don't care who it's in. If you want to know the difference between the lamb and the pig, always remember that when a pig gets in the mud, he wallows. And when a lamb gets in the mud, he cries. And there's something about someone who's a real son and daughter that even though they make a mistake, they fall into sin. When they get there, they go, I can't stay here. I don't feel clean here. I don't feel right here. I don't feel good here. And other people are wallowing in it. And something in you goes, I feel disgusting. 
I have to take a shower. I need to get my life clean. I got to repent. I got to do because you feel you're a lamb in mud. And you need to lean into that. Don't fight that. Don't resist that because that is the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. You want conviction. Condemnation is I messed up. My dad's going to kill me. Conviction is I messed up. I need to call my dad. Does that make sense to you? So there's a difference. You have a loving father that, that cares about you and loves you and you need to call him. Because his response is not going to be to kill you, it's going to be to rescue you. Praise the Lord. This is such an amazing sermon, Pastor Jonathan. Wow. So we have to fight. What do you fight with? With this encouragement, use your prophecy. And I want you guys to follow with me on the screen as much as you can. And keep the verses up as long as you can. With this encouragement, use your prophecies as weapons to wage spiritual warfare. So with your children, they have to have prophecies that have been spoken over them. So they have something to fight with. So they have something to fight with. What are the things that have been spoken over you? Because I always tell you there's a king in every kid and there's a kid in every king. So when you can look at a young man and say there's a king in you. Do you hear me? Listen to me. There's a king in you. When he knows there's a king in him, it, it helps him control the kid in him. You ever watch a man and his life was totally destroyed? Just totally destroyed. He did something and it just wrecked his life. How many of you have ever seen the news or something and just you've seen that happen? Do you know why that happened? The kid got loose. Yep. The kid will always kill the king. You lose your marriage, the kid got loose. You, you, lose, you lose your family, the kid got loose. And there's a kid in every single man in here that wants to destroy your life. He will destroy you. And that's why as to your husband, to your sons, to your daughters, to your wife, you have to keep speaking a kingly prophecy over, you, over them. There's a king in you. You can't do that because there's a king in you. God's called you to be a prophet to the nations. God's called you to be a leader. God's called you to be an entrepreneur. God's called you to be a CEO. You're going to be a teacher. You're going to, whatever it is, you've got to start prophesying destiny over your children you're going to be a virgin you're going to marry as a virgin you're going to get a degree you're, you're all of your children all of my grandchildren are going to be blessed all of them are going to be filled with the holy ghost you will not have a divorce you will stay married all the days of your life you're going to wait and keep yourself till you're married come on how many parents in here want this for you so you got to speak this and declare this over your children you have to give them their identity in hebrew culture the father names the child because your identity comes from your father. That's why you got to know who God is. So you can know who you are. Praise the Lord. Your identity. How I see myself. How I see myself has everything to do with how I see my father. And so you have to know that you have a loving father who cares about you and loves you and has called you and has spoken things off of you, over your life. And that is how you fight. Knowing there's a king in you, you can fight the kid in you. But if you don't prophesy that over your children, that kid is going to destroy them. And how many parents in here, you can see the king in the kid. Come on. You can see it when you look at him. You go, there's a king in you. And you got to say it. When my, kids, when my kids mess up, my sons, I tell them, I said, don't you forget who you are. Don't you forget who you are. Who are you? I'm this, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this. God said this. I know I'm supposed to do that. Don't you forget it. Because the world wants you to, wants you to believe you are what you did. Oh, you had a homosexual experience. You must be homosexual. You told a lie, you must be a liar. You stole something, you must be a thief. You are not what you did. You are who he says you are. So you have to remember who you are. It's like the prodigal son. He was in the hog pen. He was in the hog pen. He started off the whole story with give me. Give me the portion of goods that falls to me. Give it to me. 
Give it to me. Give me. After he wrecked everything, he comes back to the Father and says, make me as one of your servants. See, the key is not to go to God and say, God, give me. The key is, God, make me. Make me. Because you're trying to get people to give you and God to give you. God is trying to make you. Because anything you get quick, you lose. Grandmama said, easy come. You know what I'm saying, Grandma, my God. <laughs> easy come, easy go. So it's not about God give me, it's God make me. The prodigal son is standing in the hall pen, mud in between his toes, and all of a sudden he comes to himself. And he says, hold on a second. How many servants in my father's house had bread to spare, and I perished with hunger? Do you know, he goes, I will arise and go to my father's house. He says this to himself while he is in the mud. He's in the mud, and he says, I will arise and go to my father's house. The first thing that came out was his head. He's still in the mud, but he goes, I will get out of here. I am, I am going to get out of here, and I'm going to go to my father. He remembered who he was. And because he remembered who he was, it pulled him out of his situation. When you remember who you are, it pulls you out of where you are. Oh, God. I wish you knew how pretty that was. If you, once you know who you are, that's why I tell my kids, don't you forget who you are. Because if they remember who they are, it'll pull them out of what they did. Identity has to be the driving force for your young people. I don't do this not because mama said it and daddy said it and the Bible said it. I don't do it because it's not who I am. I'm not, I don't do that because that's not who I am. I am a child of the king. I have a destiny over my life. God has called me at a young age to impact thousands of people for the kingdom. So I'm not doing it because there's some rule that says I can't do it. I don't do it because it's not who I am. It's not in my DNA. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Mark. So, and one other thing when it comes to devotions, if you struggle with doing devotions by yourself, if you go, I don't ever do them, then don't do them by yourself. Most people don't like to eat by themselves. Most people, if they work out, they're going to do better if they work out with somebody. Most people like that you, you'll eat longer if you eat with people. Praise the Lord. If you just go over here to McDonald's and yell out a window and grab it out the next window and scarf it down, you almost, you're not even out to drive and you're eating. <laughs> them fries, you eating them fries. Them fries go down, you don't even need a drink. They just shh, down, they just shh, down. Come on, praise the Lord. Anything unhealthy goes down easy. Anything that is healthy, you have to chew. Go up here and eat a, come up here and eat some broccoli. Just eat a, eat a piece of raw broccoli. You can get a whole cheeseburger and a large fry and a Coke down before you get that head of broccoli down. Come on, am I right about it? Yeah. Healthy things take some time. Healthy things take a little time. Okay? It's like, okay, well, I got to chew this a little bit. I got to chew on this verse. This ain't, this ain't McDonald's fries. These ain't little Debbies. <laughs> little Debbies go down. You ever seen how easy little Debbies open too? <laughs> they just open. You're like, oh, I was gonna, oh, it opened. I was, you know, I was just, it's just already open. You just touch it open. They need to put them things in how they wrap your kids' toys. You ever try to get a toy out of a package? That's how they need, they need to package little Debbies with that stuff. <laughs> so, he begins to tell them, fight with the prophecies that have been spoken over your life. So let's pray that prayer. Everybody put their hand on their heart and say, thank you, Jesus, for the prophecies that have been spoken over my life. I will wage spiritual warfare by faith with a clean conscience, and I will become a person of, that is virtuous and a person of true faith in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Come on, give God a praise if you believe it. Then he goes on. Let's go to chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 1. He says, most of all, I'm writing to encourage you to pray with gratitude. That's for all of us. You got to pray with gratitude. That means prayer is not complaining. Complaining is how you tell God you don't approve of how he's running your life, right? So when you pray, you got to pray with gratitude. How many people pray over their food before they eat it? Raise your hand if you pray over your food. Why do you do that? You do that because you believe that if I pray over my food, if there's anything wrong in the food, that God will protect me, right? So you say, Lord, bless this food. So you believe the prayer over your food protects you from anything wrong in the food that could hurt you. Same thing happens in any area of thankfulness. It insulates your heart. It protects you. So when you're thankful for your marriage, it protects your marriage. When you're thankful for your food, it protects your food. When you're thankful for your children, it protects your children. When you're thankful for your church, it protects your church. When you're thankful for your career, it protects your career. In areas of your life where you've stopped being thankful, you've started to get sick. So it's going to require some humility because healing's in your humility. In most areas of your life where you have pain, you have pride. And we're willing to go through a lot of humility to get healed in our bodies. You go to the doctor, they put you in a gown with no back, put you on a table, your feet don't touch the ground, they're just dangling, you don't have any pants on, you know, now anybody comes in with pants looks smarter than you, pants always beats no pants, and so you're like, you know, you're giving these people all your information, social security number, you're paying them, you're telling them all your family history, everything that's ever been wrong with you, and they see you for like 30 seconds. And this is the kind of humility that we're willing to walk through to get healed in our body. What kind of humility are you willing to walk through to get healed in your spirit and your soul? Amen. And so he says, I'm writing you uh, to pray with gratitude, to be thankful. Say, "Thank thank you, Jesus. Let me have a spirit of gratitude. In every area of my life. And then it says, I'm going to make you all upset here for a moment, but it says, pray for all men with all forms of prayers and requests as you intercede with intense passion. Intercede with what? Intense passion. When's the last time somebody said, you really got some intense passion about this? When was the last time you heard that about anything? Right? Some of Lord, I just pray that you would... You know, help me be good and help me be a multimillionaire. And you can't treat prayer like you got to take out the trash. I got to take out the trash, wash the car, and pray. It can't be a, this chore. It can't be this like burden to do. It's got to be something that you look forward to. Do you know n- people's most n- number one reason for coming to church is to come to church? Well, let me back up. 10% of evangelical parents open the Bible and read it with their children. 10%. Most people don't pray and read the Bible. Most people don't, okay? And so their number one reason for coming to church is hear somebody who is doing that, hear what God is saying. That, is, that should not be your number one reason for coming to church because you should be hearing what God is saying seven days a week. Your number one reason for coming to church is is to hear someone who's spending time with God confirm what God has been saying to you when you spend time with God. So then the word of God is no longer, church is no longer revelation, but confirmation. And the word of God is so much better and sweeter when it's confirmation. It's gotten ripe. Does that make sense to you? And when, when you come in here and you've been spending time with God all week and you're writing things down and you come in here and I start preaching and you start going like, and you start hitting somebody, look at that, read that. Read that. Do you see that? I wrote that in my Bible on Wednesday and pastor just said that. How? That's God. That is God. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And now all of a sudden... 
Now all of a sudden the word of God is so much better because you're like, that ain't nothing but confirmation. I just wrote that in my Bible. That God just, my wife just said that to me last night. I have to do, because you know why you need confirmation? You need confirmation, not so you can just slap people and yell. You need confirmation because you have to make decisions on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. You got to know what to do. And when you get the confirmation, now you can go, I know exactly what I need to do tomorrow. I know I need to call. I know I need to sell it. I know I need to buy it. I know I need to call them and say this. I know. Now you can make decisions without fear. A lot of us are, are, we have such a fear of making the wrong decision that we don't make any decisions. And all while you're not making a decision, life is passing you by. And you're like a person who's pulled into the intersection and cars are going by. People are moving on their destiny. And you're frustrated because you don't know what to do. But if you would spend time with God, the same God that is speaking to you is the same God that's speaking to me. And now you're going to get that confirmation in God's house. Praise the Lord. All right. Hold your wig down. Here we go. Chapter chapter 2, verse 2. And it says, pray for every political leader and representative. What? Who put that in there? When did they put that in there? Pray for every political leader and representative. It didn't say pray for those that you vote for. It didn't say pray for those that you like. It said pray for every political leader and representative. Why? Why do I have to do that? So that we would be able to live tranquil, undisturbed lives as we worship the awe-inspiring God with pure hearts. That's why we pray for them. And it is pleasing to our Savior God to pray for them. It brings joy to the Lord when we pray for our political leaders. And they're the first group to pray for. It says start your prayer by praying for them first. Some of you are like, I'm going to have to redo my prayer list. (laughs) They're not even on there. So it says, pray for them first. Pray for them. Pray for your nation. Pray for America. How many of you want God to bless America? God bless America. I'm first generation American. My dad's not even American, but pray. I pray for my nation. I live here. That's where my passport says I belong. If I go somewhere else, I'm going to be like, hey, after a certain time, you got to go home. You got to go back home. So I want, I want my home to be blessed. Anybody else want your home to be blessed? How many people want peace in America? Love in America, joy in America, healing in America, unity in America. Don't burn it down. Don't, don't, don't destroy America. Heal America. Help God bless America. Pray for our leaders that they make good decisions. So raise your hand and say, thank you, Jesus. I believe you're going to save every political leader, every representative. Fill them with the Holy Spirit that we can live a blessed life. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give God praise, right? So pray for them. Pray for them. Pray for your nation. That's what a lot of people do at church. I don't like church. I'm leaving it. Don't leave it. Fix it. Protests from the inside. The church is way, this is way better than when I got it. I was like 19 20, it was way better. The church was singing songs like, let the flag fly high from the castle of my heart, from the castle of my heart, from the castle of my heart. Let it fly in the sky. Let the whole world know. Let the whole world know. This is way better. This is way better. Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. I don't know why we marched, but we just had to march. And so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. You know, come on, you understand? Like, it's way better. It's way better. You know why? Because we didn't abandon it. We didn't destroy it. We didn't say there's things wrong with the church. Let's destroy it. We said there's things wrong with the church. Let's fix it. Let's get better. Let's reach the next generation. Come on, somebody. Like, that's got to be the attitude towards your business, towards your family, towards your nation, towards the church. Don't destroy it. And so he says, pray for them. And then um, 
let's go down to, uh, let's go to chapter 3. It says, if any of you aspire to be overseers in the church, ministers in the church, um, and have your, you have your heart set on a noble uh, ambition, for the word is true, yet an elder needs to be one who is without blame for others. He should be one whose heart is for his wife alone and not another woman. He should be recognized as one who is sensible, well-behaved, and living a disciplined, disciplined life. He should be a spiritual shepherd who has the gift of teaching and is known for his hospitality. He should not be drunken. And drunken is not just drunk on wine. You can be drunk on pride, bitterness, lust, anger, anything that causes you to lose your ability to make rational decisions. Praise the Lord. There's people who are in prison who got drunk on anger. Just drunk on anger. Just, you can't make rational decisions. Do not do not say, Lord Jesus, I will never be drunk. Come on, say it. Some of you are like, I don't want to pray that because I got a six-pack in I bought last night, and I'm going to have to throw it out. Come on, raise your hand right now. Lord Jesus, I will not be drunk. I will not lose control of my family, my marriage, and my decisions. In Jesus' name, praise the Lord. Okay? Um, he cannot be a drunkard or someone who lashes out at others, argumentative, or someone who simply craves more money, but instead recognized by his gentleness. His heart should be set on guiding his household with wisdom and dignity, bringing up his children to worship, with devotion and purity. So you've got to train your children how to do devotions. You've got to train them how to do this. Hey, guys, let's sit down. We're going to run through this. Hey, does that stand, that stands out to you? How's that? All right, let's pray about it. Let's pray that, pray that verse right now. Now, can you imagine where you'd be in your knowledge of the word if you had been seven years old till now, praying scripture all of your life? You could walk to anybody who's depressed and just start speaking scripture over them. Your friend comes to you, I'm dealing with depression. Let me pray for you right now. And you pray scripture over them. You pray the word of God over them. You begin to prophesy destiny over them because you're doing this daily. His heart should be set on guiding his household with wisdom and dignity, bringing up his children to worship with devotion and purity. For he is unable, if he is unable to properly lead his own household well, how can he properly lead God's household? He should not be a new disciple who would be vulnerable to living in the clouds of conceit and fall into pride, making himself easy prey for Satan. He should be respected by those who are unbelievers. Can people in the world respect you? Praise the Lord. Come on. You can't curse a generation and then try to reach a generation. Wow. Having a beautiful testimony among them, so that he will not fall into the traps of Satan and be disgraced. So you've got to have people around you that can build you up. Build you up. People, who, people around you that can like support you. Does that make sense to you? People around you who can like help lift you up if you feel like, like you're falling down. That's what we need. We need that in every area of life. Um, somebody get uh, Deontay or DaVinci for me. Go, go get one of the two of those guys or Nate. I need, I need a couple of guys and tell them all to bring out a couple of chairs. So somebody go do that for me because I'm, I'm thinking of things as I'm doing this. Is that okay? Um, let's do this one. Chapter 4, verse 8. For athletic training only benefits you for a short season, but righteousness brings lasting benefits in everything for righteousness and contains the promise of life for time and eternity say for time and eternity see god god created time for man but god doesn't live in time god lives in eternity we live in time so so say this stage is a timeline and we're here so we can we know what happened yesterday but we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow but this is our this is our time window um so god lives in 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 eternity we exist in time so this is our timeline this is where you are god stands back and apart from time and he looks at time from an eternal perspective so he can see where you where you were and where you are and where you will be in one glance 
So your past, your present, and your future are all locked into his peripheral vision. That's why he can be the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Because he's not in time. He's outside of time. So he can reach into your yesterdays and heal your yesterdays so that you can be free today and be loose tomorrow. Does that make sense to you? Time and eternity. For, for the sake of the ministry, we toil tirelessly and are criticized continually. So if, so if you want to be in ministry, you've got you to be okay with being criticized. Some people are like, well, I just disagree. Well, you have to get in line. Because there's a big, long line. Well, I just don't like pastor. You have to take a number. Because there's a lot of people who just don't like me. You've got to be okay with it. When I get up here and I say truth, like it's okay to be who God made you to be. It's okay to believe that marriage is between a man and a woman. It's okay to believe in life and protect the sanctity of life. That these are not political issues, that these are biblical issues. I am not Republican or Democrat, I'm Biblican. Okay? I'm a Bible believing Christian that has believed that all of my life and will believe that all of my life. And when that offends people, they criticize you, but what's offended is their flesh. Their flesh is offended. And it's okay to have your flesh offended for you to bring change, for you to repent. Praise the Lord. You can't, you can't get healing if, if people don't tell you the truth. Grace lets people belong, but only truth sets people free. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So when I go to the doctor, they weigh me. And then... And then we have a conversation. And it's an awkward conversation. And it, but it's a necessary conversation. Because if I just go based on how much room's left in my sweatpants, I'm good. Like, I don't know why we're talking about this. Right? But there is, there is a best. So the doctor can tell you, this is the best for you. According to your height, and your, your age, this is, this is your best. And somebody has to tell you that. As awkward as that may feel, as difficult as that may feel, as much as your flesh does not want to hear that, somebody has to love you enough to tell you where God's best is for your life so then you know how far off you are from where you need to be. So you can start making the necessary steps to get back to God's best for your life. Come on out here, guys. If you're backstage, come on out. I'm going to let these guys help me in the illustration. They don't know what's happening because I just came up with it. But come on out here. Okay, so put these chairs in like a circle, like a little bit of a circle. And um, yeah, okay. And then, well, you guys didn't count the chairs and guys, I guess. So it's, well, one, two, three, four. Okay. So, um, I'm thinking of this illustration as I do it. Okay, so, yeah, let's do this. And then let's let Nate be in the middle. And, yeah, let's do it like this. No, you get on the chair. No, no, stand on the chair. You got to stand on the chair. Sorry. Okay. So, how many people would agree that I could pull him off of here quicker than he could pull me up on it? Raise your hand if, you're, if you agree with that. I could yank him off of this chair quicker than he could lift, you know, tiny on the chair with him, right? That, that's why you got to be careful when you first get saved and you go like, I'm going to try and, you know, win somebody else you got to be careful because people people can pull you back or pull you down quicker than you can pull them up does that make sense like in a quickness boom i can yank you right back out all right quicker than you can pull me up but the reason you need that is you need to get you can get down nate 
But if you get in a small group, stand in the middle there, and you, um, you stand there, and you, you stand on this one, and uh, Joe, you stand on this one, and James, you stand on that one. And then you stand on this one. CC, stand on that one. <laughs> now, we get him, we get him, he say he's an, an unbeliever, but all these are my small group guys. We can pull him up quicker than he can pull all, all of us down. Does that make sense to you? So the reason why you need community in church, the reason why you need a small group, the reason why you need to get connected in a team is because now that we're in a team, because maybe, maybe uh, Yandi just got saved and he's trying to witness to him. He can get yanked down here, but when he can get him around his brothers, when he can encourage them together, when he's like, hey, his story connects more to you or his story connects more to you. Now as a brotherhood, this is why all the men need to be on our men's prayer every, every Tuesday morning at 6 a.m. We got about 120 men on there. So that we can build each other up. Build, the Bible says build each other up in your most holy faith. Praise the Lord. Come on, give God a big praise. Thank you, guys. So it says, for the sake of the ministry, in verse 30, for the sake of the ministry, we told tirelessly, we're criticized continually simply because our hope is in the living God. People will criticize you because your hope is not in a political leader. Your hope is not in the government. Your hope is not in some other cause. They will criticize you because your hope is in the living God. And they'll tell you, well, this is a different issue. We need to, we need to do other things other than just pray. We need to do other things other than just other than trust God with it. I'm telling you, your hope as a believer is in Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that prayer is the only thing we do. I'm saying prayer is the first thing thing we do the first so whatever you do after that you did it because you prayed about it you're not acting out of your emotions or your anger or your frustration or what somebody said you go i prayed about it god spoke to me and now i'm making decisions because prayer is not the only thing but it is the first thing even in coming to a church don't look for a church where everybody loves you Look for a church where you can love everybody. Praise the Lord. So you don't walk in here. Everybody here is not going to like you. Some of y'all got siblings they don't like you. Why is it so important that people like you? God likes you. Is that enough? Why are you so hung up on everybody liking you? Well, they just don't like me. Everybody's not going to like you. You ain't likable to everybody. Praise the Lord. I know your mother told you you're the most wonderful thing that ever existed, but she lied. She lied to you. She lied. And everybody's not going to think you're wonderful. And that's okay. Because God thinks you're wonderful. So your self-esteem and your value as a believer can't come from these people. It's the same mistake that you, you put that on your husband. You need to make me happy. You need to make me feel like I'm worth something. You need to, nobody can do that for you. Only God can do that for you. You're like pouring into a bucket with a hole. You look nice today. Didn't say anything about yesterday. <laughs> nobody can fill that tank. Only God can fill that tank. And when it comes to your husbands, ladies, you got to affirm your husband. You have to affirm them. One of the five needs of a man is affirmation, verbal praise, because we're created in the likeness and the image of God. God. God loves verbal praise. Men are made in his likeness and in his image. Men love verbal praise. You have to affirm them. You have to do that. You have to do that so no one else does it. You have to affirm them more than anybody else because just like little boys, wherever the noise is, that's where the attention goes. They draw the little picture. Mommy, I brought that juice for you. Oh, my God, it's so wonderful. It's just a so picture. It's just so wonderful. You put it on the refrigerator. Right? And you just put it up there. And just like that, it starts at little ages. And then when we bring you, the day I bring you roses, and you're like, that was nice. You know what they just told me? Don't bring you roses. Don't bring you roses. It's, 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 but but when, you, when you give the affirmation to it, that tells me continue to do that. 
affirmation. And that's external pressure. You got to be careful with external pressure. I told this to the, the teenagers the other night. I did it when I, I did the Vikings chapel last night. And I told, I told the Vikings, they better win today. But I told the Vikings, I said, look, I did this illustration. I held a bottle of water. I told them, I said, look, you can't stop external pressure. External pressure is everything was fine until Mary came to town. And now Jim doesn't want to stay with Helen because Mary's talking about if I were with you and I understand what you're going through and, and I know how you feel and it may not be any of, my, any of my business, but if I was your woman, what can you do? What can you do when you send the kids to college? Are you going to shut all the mouths of the professors? What can you do when you send them here or send them there? What can you do? You've got to fortify the inside. The reason I cannot crush this bottle of water is because the pressure on the inside is greater than the pressure on the, on the outside. That's the only reason I can't smash it. Like I'm squeezing as hard as I can. I cannot crush it because the pressure on the inside of this bottle, it's full. And that's what's stopping the external pressure right now from destroying it. So you can't stop the external pressure. You got to keep putting into your marriage, putting into your children, putting into your teenagers, putting into your husband, putting into your wife, put it in, 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 so that they can withstand the external pressure that life is going to bring. So they don't begin to crush like a can held in the hands of a strong man. You got to fortify the inside. That's what affirmation does for your husband. My wife can get me to do anything by, by just affirming me. Anything. Anything. If women knew, the, if y'all knew the power you had, the power of a wom, woman's words. There was a woman in my parents' church. Her husband had passed away. And I told my mother, this was years ago. I told my mom, I said, she'll be married in a year. This woman, she'll be married in a year. And my mom said, why do you say that? I said, trust me. This woman will be married. She said, why do you say that? It wasn't that the woman was a very beautiful woman. She wasn't a very beautiful woman. But, but this woman would be married because she knew what to say. This woman knew what to say. This woman could turn your head around like the exorcist. <laughs> she knew what to say. And a woman who knows what to say. Oh, God. I'm telling you, my wife can get me to do anything. She said, baby, nobody cooks eggs the way you cook eggs. She gave me clean the whole house. She said, the way you vacuum around the baseboard, I don't know how you do that, the way you get down there and clean the baseboard. I ain't never seen nobody do that like that in all my life. <laughs> my wife will go to Target and buy 8,000 bags of groceries and come in the house with keys. <laughs> and I'll say, can't you bring in one bag? She said, baby, you're just so big and strong. <laughs> And you, I just knew you could do it. I go out there and pick all them bags. <laughs> My hands be red. Bring them all in the house. Because she's affirming me. And God is like that. Whenever you start affirming God, God, can't nobody heal me the way you heal me. Nobody provide for me the way you provide for me. <laughs> nobody forgives me the way you forgive me. God starts flexing his muscles and showing off for you. And so affirmation is one of, the, one of the big needs of depositing and investing into your, your children. Praise the Lord. I'm almost done with you. Y'all get anything out of this? Yeah. Let me leave you with this last, this last thing. I'm hungry. I'm good. And we got our food truck out there, Marnas. That's one of our, one of our members here in the church. And all the restaurants have been closed down, so we want to support. Come on, we want to support our brothers and sisters, so get something out there. And I've already prayed all the fat and calories out of all that stuff, so it's all healthy, too, now when you leave. If you believe that, I got a, a bridge in London I want to sell you, too. But. Um, so 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse, verse 13 says, I will, I will come be... Be in delight, devouring the word of God. you got to devour it. So until I come, be diligent in devouring the word of God. Be faithful in prayer and in teaching the believers. Don't minimize the powerful gifts that operate in your life. Good Lord, y'all see that? Look at that. What is going on? It's just on this side. It ain't on this side. It's just here. 
Don't minimize the powerful gifts that operate in your life. Don't minimize it. Don't let your children minimize the gifts that God has put in them. Don't you minimize. Do you know there's a lot of people who are gifted to do things, but they've minimized it and they don't operate in it? There's people in this church who are called to write songs. People in here called to teach, preach, minister, uh, prophesy, missionary. Some of y'all should be on the stage singing and helping in kids and ministry, but you've minimized the gift that God has placed down on the inside of you. So it says, don't minimize the powerful gifts that operate in your life, for it was imparted to you by the laying on of hands by the elders. And we're in a society right now where people don't want to lay hands on nobody. Nobody wants to touch anybody. And touch is, is, is really how the kingdom operates. The kingdom operates by touch. The Bible doesn't even say pray for the sick. It says lay hands on the sick. The Bible never said pray for the sick. It said lay hands on the sick that they may recover. Now, how are we going to lay hands on you? How are we, how are we going to do that? Come on. We got to believe. We got to have faith and trust the Lord. And some things, in order to get that, you got to be in an atmosphere of faith, an atmosphere of expectancy, an atmosphere of, of possibilities and opportunities. That's why online is a supplement, but it is not a replacement. It's not a replacement, okay? It's not a replacement for school either. We just got the stat this week. One out of three teenagers in America is failing in distance learning. One out of three. That's one to you, one to you, one to you. They're failing. That's why every parent in here, you, I'm telling you, you need to really consider Creative Academy in this season. You need to really consider it. We're, when we're rolling it out in January, somebody say amen about it, January, where we can teach our children to not be ashamed of their faith. And you can, there's a, right at the LED screen out there, we've got our, our leaders for it. You can talk to them, ask questions, and the website's up, mycreativeacademy.org. All the classes and electives and all of that, K through 12. And you need to look into it, parents, because enrollment is firing right now. We've already got our teachers in place. And I'm telling you, you need to get your kids involved in this because we can't afford to lose our, t we cannot afford to lose the next generation. Praise the Lord. So put my verse back up. I'm going to leave you with this. Don't minimize the powerful gifts that operate in your life, for it was imparted to you by the laying on of hands of the elders, and it was activated through the prophecy they spoke over you. Activated through the prophecy they spoke over you. Anybody got any cash? Anybody just got a dollar or anything around here? Anybody got any money? Look in your purses, bags. Somebody, just ever somebody bring me a piece of money if you got a piece of money. Here, we got this right here. $20. Thank you so much. All right, perfect. Give her a big God bless you. Okay, come on up here. You're going to be my illustration again. Oh, no. Come up this way. You got it. Okay. All right. So let's use this. Let me use Larnell from St. Paul. All right. So don't minimize the powerful gifts. So this is a gift. It's a $20 gift that operates in your life. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this $20 bill into your life. For it was imparted to you by the laying on of hands by the elders. So I just gave it to you. And it was activated through the prophecy they spoke over you. So a lot of you can have a gift that's in you, but it's not activated. So how do you activate it? You activate it through the prophetic word that's spoken over you. So when you go to your children and you, they have gifts in them. How many people believe that? When you look at your kids, you're like, they have gifts, they have a gift. How do you activate that gift as a parent? I spoke to the teenagers here, and if you don't have your teenagers here, they need to get here on Wednesday nights, we had 160 teenagers here. That's why these teenagers got baptized, because they said, I want to get baptized because of what God did in their life on Wednesday night. 160 teenagers here, unashamed, lifting up Jesus, right? And I prophesied over about 20 of them. And when I prophesied over them, I activated the gift in them. So when you go to your son and daughter and you prophesy something over them, you activate that gift in them. One of the greatest gifts you could give your kids this Christmas is the, is, a, is the ability to activate a prophetic word in their life. Most children have never received a prophetic word from their parent. Ever. They've received prayer, but not a prophetic word. And you should, you should prophesy something over your children this Christmas. Write it down. Frame it so they can put it in the room. Give them a box of tennis shoes and say, 
you know, a lot of people don't know what it's like to walk in your shoes, but I do. And I prophesy that everywhere you go in this, these shoes, that God will lead you into your destiny. That you will not, these will not take you anywhere that would cause you harm and pain. But they will lead you to people that you can be a place of healing and medicine for the next generation. God is going to use you to reach the next generation. Prophesy greatness over them. Amen? That you're going to go to different nations, that God's going to use you. Next thing you know, they start, it activates it. They start Googling, you know, where can I go on a missions trip? Where can I do, because it's at, you've activated the prophecy in their life. And it's just like this. So I give them the $20 gift, and then look at the verse. By the elders, and it was activated through the prophecy spoken over you. So someone greater than me and greater than you, hold the $20 bill up. Greater than me and greater than you spoke a prophetic word over this piece of paper. And they prophesied that this piece of paper is now worth $20. Does that make sense? Somebody prophesied that. I didn't. I can look at, I can look at this sheet of paper and go, you're $20. <laughs> it's not $20. Come on, amen? But someone else who has a greater authority than me and a greater authority than you has prophesied that this $20, that this piece of paper is now worth $20. That's the prophecy. And now that they have spoken it, it activates and turns this piece of paper into $20. And anywhere you go in the world, that is still worth $20. Because of the prophecy that is spoken over it. Once it's prophesied, it goes from just being ordinary to extraordinary. It activates it. So now you've got to take your children, just like you take this $20, and just as the government has prophesied, this is worth 20 bucks. you've got to take your child and declare what they are worth, and no matter what happens to it. So you can take this $20 and rip it in half. You rip it in half. All right? And I can tape it back together and go to the bank, and guess what it's worth? Now I could take it. And throw it on the ground, crinkle it up. Come on, Larnell. <laughs> you pick it up just because you're more lean. And I could take it, we crinkled it up, it's smashed up, it's dirty. I could have run it over in the parking lot. I could have sneezed on it, coughed on it, put COVID on it, whatever it is. <laughs> and I take it to the bank, tape it. Guess what it's worth? So nothing it's been through, nothing it's ever been through takes away its value because the prophecy, oh my God, the prophecy is still true. It's still worth $20. Amen? Who did I get this? Now, if you tape that back, it's worth $20. <laughs> Give her a big God bless you. Thank you, Larnell. From St. Paul. Did you get something out of this today? Come on, give God a big praise all over the house. So nothing you've been through in your life can take away your value. You are who God says you are. You can do what he said you can do, and you can have what he said you can have. Praise the Lord. So here's what I want to do. I want to pray for you. Because I think there's some people in this room who feel like what you've been through and what you've done or where you've been are just the tears and the rips and the challenges and the vicissitudes of life have caused you not to value yourself properly. And today God wants to raise the value that you place on yourself. Because you are not what you did, you are who he says you are. And if you're here today and you go, I don't know Jesus, I don't have a relationship with Jesus, and I want to know him, I want to have a relationship with him. He wants to have a relationship with you. And I made a decision years ago to ask Jesus into my heart, and I did it for three reasons. Number one, I needed a friend. Number two, I needed forgiveness. And number three, I needed a future. I didn't have a future. And that's why I gave my life to Jesus. I needed a friend, forgiveness, and future. And I'm going to give you an opportunity in just a moment. We're all going to stand. And I'm going to ask you, if you want to accept Jesus into your heart, I'm going to ask you to do something that, you know, your flesh is going to fight you on. 
is I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and then I'm going to ask you to make a bold commitment to say in front of everybody, I'm willing to accept Jesus into my heart and let me pray for you. And you know, the Bible says, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. And I don't want Jesus to be ashamed of me. I bind shyness off of you right now in the name of Jesus. Shyness is a curse that robs you from your possibilities and opportunities. Quit speaking it over your children. It will rob them. You want your children to be bold and courageous and full of faith. Come on, parents. Am I right about it? So quit saying that. Quit saying it. Quit saying that. Don't say that ever again. You're not shy. You're, you got courage. You got courage. You're courageous. You're strong. You can do it. Speak up. I go to kids and I'll talk to them. They look at me. I say, look up. Look up. Look at me when you talk. You're somebody. You're somebody. Look up. People should be honored to know you. Tell an eight-year-old that. Tell a nine-year-old that. Let them, let them get their confidence up. There's nobody can give you self-esteem. That's why it's called. You got to get that stuff from God. And it takes courage. It takes humility. I got to go to the, going to the doctor. All right, I got to do this. I got to do that. It takes humility to get healed. Humility. And don't live the rest of your life with pain and pride. Don't do that. Don't live in stubbornness. Stubbornness ain't cool and it ain't sexy. Nobody wants stubborn. Nobody wants dry. Live the life that God's called you to live, and that starts with humility. And I'm going to ask you to, all of us, to stand in a moment, and I'm going to give an opportunity for those who say, I need to get saved. Maybe you've done that in the past, but for whatever reason, you've walked away from the Lord, and you just go, I need to really recommit my life. Basically, if you're not sure if you would die today, that you would spend eternity in heaven and you want to be sure, I want to give you that opportunity. And I realize there may not be one person in here that needs to do it, but if there's one, you are the most important person in this room. The most important person in this room. And every single thing we've done today was for you. You matter. You matter. You're not a number. You're a person with a name and a story. And your story matters to us and it matters to God. Amen. So let's all stand all over this house. And I want to pray for you. And I want to give people an opportunity to make that decision for Jesus today. It's the greatest decision you could ever make in your life is to say, Jesus, I need you. And I want a relationship with you. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, you just honor me for a moment. If you're here and you say, Pastor Jonathan, I want to pray that prayer today. I want to ask Jesus into my heart. When I count to three, just lift your hand. That's one. If you're contemplating it, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. That's what Jesus sounds like. You might be here with your wife. You're going to grab her by the hand and say, we're going to go down. You might be here. You're a teenager, a young adult. You might be here. You're 78 years old, whatever area, season, stage of life you're in. Nothing in this world is worth you missing eternity. And that's two. If you're, if you're contemplating it, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Like I said, that's what Jesus sounds like. And you have everything to gain and nothing to lose. That's three. Just lift your hand up right now. I see you. 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 I see you guys. I see you. Now, I'm gonna, just while that hand's in the air, I want permission to pray for you. I want to pray for you. I personally want to pray for you. And with every head bowed, every eye closed, when I count to three, I want you to just move out from where you are and I want you to come right down here with me and I want to pray for you. I know you're like, I don't want to do that in my flesh. I'm not talking to your flesh. I'm talking to who you really are. Who you really are as a man and a woman. This is a serious moment between you and God. And this is a private moment between you and God. When I count to three, just move out from where you are and come right down here. One, two, three. Just come right now. Move in boldness. Come right now. Come on, cheer them on. Cheer them on. Just cheer them on. Come on, come right down here. Come on, guys, cheer them on. Come on, Creative Church. These are our brothers and sisters. I'm so proud of you. I'm proud. I am so proud of all of you. I'm proud of you. And I want the opportunity to get to know you and help you in your walk with the Lord. I don't know if you've ever had anybody offer to help you, but I want to help you. 
and I want to I want to offer you something. I want to offer you something. Tomorrow, I'm sorry, Tuesday night, Tuesday night, I'm going to make myself available. I just started doing this. This will be the, the fourth one I've done. But this Tuesday night, 6.30 to 7.30, I would love to meet you here. If you have children, I have child care ready for you, but right here at our Maple Grove campus. And I would love an hour to talk with you, to spend with you, to help you grow in your next step with Jesus. I have a book I want to give you, but I want to get to know you, your name. I want to talk to you. I want to help you. And just one hour. I'd love to invest an hour into you if you'll let me. You may have plans or whatnot and you can't change. I understand. But if you can make it, I'd love to have that opportunity to connect with you. Um, that's what I would want my pastor to do. And so that's what I'm offering to you. But we're all going to pray this prayer together. And if you want to do that, if you're like, Pastor, I want to do that, right before you go back to your seats and, and we get ready to, to have our kids come out on stage, right behind you here, I've got about 15 people with clipboards, and they just want to write down your name and number. They're going to send you one text. Just one text. That's it. They're not going to call you or anything like that. They're going to send you a one text reminder just to say, hey, just a reminder. This is what it is if you want to come. And, um, but I want to pray for them. Are you proud of them? I'm so proud of them. Amen. Would you stretch forth your hand to them? And let's all pray this prayer together. Come on, say, Lord Jesus, I love you. Thank you for loving me. I believe you died on the cross and you rose from the dead. And because you live, I can live. Today, I receive the gift of eternal life. I have a promise and a relationship with you. Help me be who you've called me to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give him a big God bless you.